Hello to chapter 16 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And this chapter is titled The Ship. In bed we concocted our plans for the morrow, but to my surprise and no small concern, Quiqueg now gave me to understand that he had been diligently consulting Yojo, the name of his black little god, and Yojo had told him two or three times over, and strongly insisted upon it every way, that instead of our going together among the whaling fleet in harbour, and in concert selecting our craft, instead of this, I say, Yojo earnestly enjoined that the selection of the ship should rest wholly with me inasmuch as Yojo purposed befriending us and, in order to do so, had already pitched upon a vessel which, if left to myself, I, Ishmael, should infallibly light upon, for all the world as though it had turned out by chance, and in that vessel I must immediately ship myself for the present irrespective of Quiqueg. I have forgotten to mention that, in many things, Quiqueg placed great confidence in the excellence of Yojo's judgment and surprising forecast of things, and cherished Yojo with considerable esteem as a rather good sort of god who perhaps meant well enough upon the whole, but in all cases did not succeed in his benevolent designs. Now, this plan of Quiqueg's or rather Yojo's touching the selection of our craft, I did not like that plan at all. I had not a little relied on Quiqueg's sagacity to point out the whaler best fitted to carry us and our fortune securely. But as all my remonstrances produced no effect upon Quiqueg, I was obliged to acquiesce and accordingly prepared to set about this business with a determined rushing sort of energy and vigour that should quickly settle that trifling little affair. Next morning, early leaving Quiqueg shut up with Yojo in our little bedroom, for it seemed that it was some sort of Lent or Ramadan or day of fasting, humiliation and prayer with Quiqueg and Yojo that day, how it was I never could find out, for though I applied myself to it several times, I could never master his liturgies. Leaving Quiqueg, then fasting on his tomahawk pipe and Yojo warming himself at his sacrificial, fi sacrificial fire of shavings, I sallied out among the shipping. After much prolonged sauntering and many random inquiries, I learned that there were three ships up for three years' voyages, the Devil Dam, the Titbit, and the Peacot. Devil Dam I do not know the origin of. Titbit is obvious. Peacot, you will no doubt remember, was the name of a celebrated tribe of Massachusetts Indians, now extinct as the ancient Medes. I peered and pried about the Devil Dam, from her hopped over to the titbit, and finally going on board the Peacot, looking around her for a moment and then decided that this was the very ship for us. You may have seen many a quaint craft in your day, for aught I know, square-toed luggers, mountainous Japanese junks, butter gawks, butter box, galliots and what not, but take my word for it, you never saw such a rare old craft as this same rare old Peacock. She was a ship of the old school, rather small in anything, with an old-fashioned claw-footed look about her. Long-seasoned and weather-stained in the typhoons and calms of all four oceans, her old, her old hull's complexion was darkened like a French grenadier's who has a like fort in Egypt and Siberia. Her venerable bows looked bearded, her masts cut somewhere on the coast of Japan, where her original ones were lost overboard in a gale. Her masts stood stiffly up like the spines of the three old kings of Cologne. 
Her ancient decks were worn and wrinkled like the pilgrim-worshipped flagstone in Canterbury Cathedral where Becket bled. But to all these, her old antiquities were added new and marvellous features pertaining to the wild business that for more than half a century she had followed. Old Captain Pellick, many years her chief mate before her commanded another vessel of his before he commanded another vessel of his own and now a retired seaman and one of the principal owners of the peacock this old pallick during the time of his chief mateship had built upon her original grotesqueness and inlaid it all over with a quaintness both of material and device, unmatched by anything except it be Thorkil Hake's carved buckler or bedstead. She was apparelled like any barbaric Ethiopian emperor, his neck heavy with pendants of polished ivory. She was a thing of trophies, a cannibal of craft, thicking herself forth in the chaste bones of her enemies, all round her unpanelled open bulwarks were garnished like one continuous jaw with the long, sharp teeth of the sperm whale inserted there for pins to fasten her old hempen thews and tendons to. Those thews ran not through base blocks of landwood, but deftly travelled over sheaves of sea ivory. Scorning a turnstile wheel at her revered helm, reverend helm, she sported there a tiller, and that tiller was in one mass, curiously carved from the long, narrow, lower jaw of her hereditary foe. The helmsman who steered by that tiller in a tempest felt like the tartar when he holds back his fiery steed by clutching its jaw, a noble craft, but somehow a most melancholy. All noble things are touched with that. Now, when I looked about the quarter-deck for someone having authority in order to propose myself as a candidate for the voyage, at first I saw nobody. But I could not well overlook a strange sort of tent, or rather wigwam, pitched a little behind the main mast. It seemed only a temporary erection used in port. It was of a conical shape, some ten feet high, consisting of the long, huge slabs of limber black bone taken from the middle and highest part of the jaws of the right whale, planted with their broad ends on the back on the deck, a circle of these slabs laced together mutually sloped towards each other and at the apex united in a tufted point where the loose hairy fibers waved to and fro like a top knot on some old Potobotami Sashem's head. A triangular opening faced towards the bows of the ship so that the insider commanded a complete view for it, forward. And half concealed in this queer tenement, I at length found one who by his aspect seemed to have authority, and who, it being noon at the, and the ship's work suspended, was now enjoying respite from the burden of command. He was seated on an old-fashioned oaken chair wriggling all over with curious carving, and the bottom of which was formed of a stout interlacing of the same elastic stuff of which the wigwam was constructed. There was nothing so very particular, perhaps, about the appearance of the elderly man I saw. He was brown and brawny, like most old seamen, and heavily rolled up in blue pilot cloth, cut in the Quaker style, only there was a fine and almost microscopic network of the minutest wrinkles interlacing round his eyes, which must have ari arisen from his continual sailings in many hard gales and always looking to windward, for this causes the muscles about the eyes to become, pur to become pursed together. 
such eye wrinkles are very effectual in a scowl. So I think that's for today because I'm a bit in a hurry. So uh, yeah, bye bye till next time with the second chapter of uh, the second part of chapter 16.